Good. Hey, Jake. Good morning. Good evening. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening for all of you. It's morning for me. How's everybody doing? What did I miss? You guys were talking about something. It sounded interesting. Talking about the universe. How complex the uh, the book gets. The universe. <laughs> Taking <laughs> notes. How notes help. Yeah. Are you a note taker, Jake, when you learn? Because you have like an immense amount of information in your brain. Do you learn by Not writing? Not a note taker. No? I actually, I've almost never taken notes on like anything really. Wow. And that's, a, that's an interesting thing. Like, um, you know, even when it comes to like magic and stuff like that, there's this whole practice of having the magic journal and like writing stuff down and whatever. But and artists do it too. Like people take studio journals and they write like, their techniques and like what mixtures they've used and stuff like that. Like I did that for a very short amount of time, but I've basically never written down or recorded like any of the, the info about like what I use in my studio. Sometimes I take notes like at first and then I'll um, memory, commit it to memory afterwards. And then after that, I don't really need to look at the notes so much, but I've been, I've been underlining stuff. I like underlining stuff when I'm reading that to me seems to be like a good way of, sort of keeping track, the like deeper, you know, digestion of what I'm reading. But yeah, yeah not, not much of a note taker, really. That's pretty cool. I don't know, the older I get, the less I retain sometimes. I, my memory is good. It's just that I'm getting into that stage where I have to write things down in order to kind of reread them later and take it in more. So I heard a study of that. Up. What were you saying? It said our that, brain is filling up, just getting more and more and more. And <laughs> <it's> <laughs> that nice. I, I, I heard a study that was something like we retain, I don't know, like like 50% more information if we take notes than if we don't or something like that. But I think it has a lot to do with attention because when you set out to take notes on something, you're paying closer attention to it than if you're not. Yeah. Um, if like it's like the difference between like passive and active listening yeah. you know i think the more you can um bring your all of your senses to a learning experience you maximize the ability to learn it absolutely that's what uh tony robbins is all about right like he makes you like scream the answers and like jump and exactly. shout and stuff like that to like right that's you know, right. scream stuff back at him so that you're really like igniting your whole body and everything when in the process of learning stuff. You know what they've done? And this is like kind of off topic, but not, but they've done studies with learning things like new languages and stuff in float tanks and sensory deprivation tanks. And they find that it's like amazingly accelerated just because of, uh, I don't know, you're like in a sort of state of trance when you're in there and your mind is completely relaxed and open. So it's like deeply suggestible. So like with learning new languages and stuff like that, like a lot of, you know, a lot of like, um, you know, millionaire techies in Silicon Valley are like building all these like learning rigs inside of float tanks where there's like screens and stuff. And it's pretty interesting, but like, it's, it's kind of cool to think that you can also use it for, for learning even, I mean, most of them have some kind of like sound system built into it where you could even play something or like listen to an audio book and just supposedly it's like a much deeper retention of information. Maybe that's why they're taking over the world. <laughs> they got everything in there. <laughs> it's, it's that and the LSD, those two things. That too. <laughs> <laughs> and the meditation, can't, can't discount that. That's also good. Yeah. So how, how's everybody doing? Um, so this week we're gonna be talking about chapter three, mental transmutation, which states mind as well as metals and elements may be transmuted from state to state, degree to degree, condition to condition, pole to pole, vibration to vibration. True hermetic transmutation is a mental art. So just any kind of initial thoughts on this, anything that stood out that was interesting about this or, or kind of any any keys that you received from reading this? Uh, 
I was telling, um, I guess, Neil, when you were getting ready, that this chapter kind of reminded me of um, the Ten Commandments when you, you picture Moses parting the sea and all these magical superpowers happening. Because um, it kind of highlights the fact that once you reach a certain level of mental transmutation, you have the power to also control matter outside. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was just out, just can't even fathom. <laughs> yeah, that's far out. Yeah. I liked what I liked what they were talking about. They they said like the hermeticists were the original alchemists, astrologers, and psychologists. And they were basically talking about how there's like an esoteric and an exoteric approach to all these different things. So like this is a, an esoteric approach to psychology. And there's you know, chemistry, with a, which is an exoteric approach to chemistry, and then, uh, and then um, alchemy is an esoteric approach to it. Or astronomy is like the exoteric version of astrology. So I thought that was interesting. It's like one deals with like the universe inside of you, and one deals with your relationship to the external world. But the hermetic master kind of marries those two things together and starts to... Um, understand both so that they can both be kind of yielded and worked with. Yeah, I think for me, this, this is one of the most important elements, you know, of the, of this book. Um, you know, the idea, I like to use, you know, emotional alchemy. You know, I think that growth, human development, human growth, mental health, consciousness, all of it is a byproduct or direct relation to transmutation. You know, the ability to take certain energetic experiences, certain ways in which we process the world and to transmute them into higher levels of sort of frequency and vibrancy and and so on. I think, you know, working in mental health, for me, it becomes really the key to what mental health is about or treatment is about is, you know, how that it, it's a conversion process. How does one, I, I like to use the word elevate because I feel like we're moving or can be moving consciously and constantly towards our higher self but it, it's really transmuting this energy, this, these moods, these feelings into something that um, has more sort of power in the world for oneself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's kind of like how in um, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl was able to use his perspective and thinking to kind of control or mitigate his experience while he was in Auschwitz. And that's quite a, you know, that's a more extreme example of somebody who was able to even in the, the harshest external conditions use the principle of mental alchemy to transform his experience. And it shows the power of the mind. And I think that's why people love people like Nelson Mandela or, you know, for the same reason, because he was like, not you know, he said that even though he was in prison, they didn't have his mind and that his mind was still free. So they could never put him in prison. And that's like very powerful. And I think that speaks to the heart of what they're talking about in this chapter. Mm -hmm. Do you guys know about this kind of like um, these different sort of levels of consciousness that's the, in the Ken Wilber integral system. It's like there's egocentric. Um, it's the next one's like ethnocentric. Then there's world centric and then there's cosmocentric. So there's like these four different levels of consciousness. So at the egocentric level, you're concerned with me and mine and it's just like very solitary, the individual self. Ethnocentric is concerned with the family or the tribe or the nation or the culture. So people who identify with being like a Yankees fan or people that really identify with like, you know, I'm an American or whatever. World centric is kind of like seeing things from the collective approach, like we're all here on one planet. And then cosmocentric is 
we're all an expression of the universal energy throughout the cosmos, like seeing things from the broadest perspective possible. I feel like what they're talking about here is partly about the transition of like ascending those different levels. So they talk about at the highest level, basically understanding the principle of mentalism at the highest level is understanding that all is the mind and that we're all basically, you know, thoughts or, or you know, a, a figment within the mind of God. And that when you can really see things from that level, when you can ascend to the highest point and see from the top of the mountain, if you will, that that allows us to begin to understand reality in such a way that it becomes kind of like more, more fluid to us, you know? And um, I mean, I've heard a lot of stories, at least from people like Ram Dass talking about like the kind of miracles that like his, guru could could create or you know there's a lot of even biblical stories with things like moses or with jesus or these people that supposedly reached a level of kind of enlightenment of their consciousness to be able to actually affect change in the material universe and they're saying that here that that's possible and that that is done by understanding the the principle of mentalism understanding that the universe is a mental phenomenon and basically by changing the, the mind of the universe, you can actually affect the way reality unfolds. And how is it that one will go like about changing the mind of the universe? That's the part of the, that I'm kind of like up in the air about trying to understand. I don't know, but we got two hours. Let's figure it out. <laughs> Let's come oh, out of here with some superpowers. <laughs> What are you going to say? <laughs> the closest I think I've seen my mind change is like I was listening to Leonard Cohen and his music is obviously very soul searching, melancholic and the song finished and I was in that mood and all of a sudden a really poppy song came up right after that and I was not anticipating that and suddenly like my mind was like whoa like suddenly like I could see that shift happen like I was living in this universe of a certain kind of music and then all of a sudden I could see like oh this is how the transition happens like suddenly I was like happy because it was pop and and I could just see that transition and I was it's just like you live in this kind of house of things and music is just so essential like it just like I think it's so close to how our minds work and how our psychology is and it was just really interesting to just notice that Mm -hmm. Yeah, impact. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think we're talking about really something that is so core. You know, when you, when you look at depression, the experience of depression, and without this, this is not intended to be pejorative or judgmental, but it's very small-mindedness is what it is, mm -hmm. you know? an extreme focus on a very sort of narrow experience and there's a loop to it so it, it just keeps you in that sort of narrow smallness it's the opposite of the universal mind you know and moving to a larger and larger space you know of seeing oneself and perspective and that's why I said the other day when we were talking, you know, embracing that we're immortal, you know, changes the perspective that we can have. You know, embracing all of this can change the perspective. And that then begins to transmute what our moods are and what our experiences are. You know, it's, um, to me, it, it becomes a real key to growth and human development and human species development on that level yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah they say here mental transmutation is the art of mental chemistry it's a form of practical mystic psychology so it's like what you're what you're talking about and i think that gets true when you get into that kind of depressed place it's like a fundamentally egocentric sort of pers perspective and it's holding people to to something very small that's why actually you know, like in, in hermetic 
stuff. They have their own methods for basically doing away with the ego, like, but they don't do it through, um, you know, long seated meditation. They do it actually through the study of the stars and the study of astrology with the idea that when you really clue into how gigantic and vast the universe is, how gigantic and vast time is through the study of these subjects that encapsulate such a large view of the universe that you begin to essentially broaden your, you, you realize that it's like, it's that you were just a tiny little, you know, speck in this vast thing that we're all a part of. And so, yeah, I agree. I mean, there can be something very, very healing to even go out and just like look at the stars on a clear night or something like that, just to get a frame of reference for just how giant the universe is and how kind of inconsequential our stories and our little problems actually are. Mm -hmm. So is it like almost like one of the things that we, that, that changed, it reminds me of what neuroplasticity is basically just changing that chemistry by, you know, by the power of thought or just possibly just exchanging the negative to the positive. Yeah, which is a fascinating phenomenon. And we can actually physically change our bodies through our thoughts. And that's documented, which is very interesting that like when you change the software, when you change the program that your mind is running, you literally change the hardware as well, which is, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think neuroplasticity and epigenetics are major breakthroughs that have occurred in the last decade or so. You know, the, there was a belief for such a long time that, you know, the brain was really not plastic. You know, and, and it's a weird word. Plastic, it just means that it's flexible and changeable and continuously changeable, you know, and the old way of thinking about it is that the brain would reach a certain milestone and essentially be fixed, and that was that. And epigenetics to me is even more powerful, and that is the idea that genes are not particularly predetermined as we believe, meaning we thought that a gene would express itself at a particular time, at a particular moment, and be a particular thing. And then we learn that genes express themselves based on their environment. That actually we can influence the way in which a gene expresses itself. I mean, ultimately. It's and, so funny. And part of this. What it's so funny, you? like you, you're talking about genes. It just makes me think like my friend just made this like funny compilation video that's like 10 minutes of Donald Trump talking about like good genes. <laughs> it's just like, every, like there's so many speeches where he's just like, he's got the Trump genes, good genes. I don't know if you guys know about genes. You don't get slow ho like horses from a, I don't know. It's just like 10 minutes of him just being like, good genes, good genes. It's just so funny. If you if you yeah, want to watch anyway. something if you want to watch something really funny and entertaining, watch the debate from last night. No, no, thank you. That no, was thanks. hysterical. That was that was, yeah. Good genes. Good yeah. genes. Good good genes. Sorry, I didn't mean to like interrupt you with that, <laughs> but it just it just made me think of that, and it was really funny. Yeah, I wanted to say there's a, a sentence in here. Um, not only may the mental states of one's self be changed or transmuted by the principles, but also the states of others may be and are constantly mm -hmm. transmuted in the same way, usually unconsciously, but often consciously mm -hmm. by some understanding the laws and principles, blah, 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 says other stuff. I know, and it says um, where the people affected are not informed of the principles of self-protection. And that reminds me of programming, speaking of the debate and everything on TV and in the media, we're constantly being programmed, that they call it programming, which is really interesting. It's just like very blatant about it. Um, and they mentioned here, so, uh, you know, you, we can program other people, they doesn't use that word, but pretty much that's what it would be, if they don't understand self-protection. But that reminds me of how we 
can learn how to protect ourselves or to be conscious and aware of when we're being presented with um, programming, recognize it, and then be able to say, like, that's that, that's not me, you know, this is me in here, that's Shakespeare's theater out there, um, and it doesn't affect me. Uh, so, but also if we want to have influence over others, we, you know, we can learn some of these principles because a lot of it, like I said, is on the unconscious level. Um, and then that's how we can also influence ourselves. I, you know, I studied hypnotherapy and um, one of the things is like talking to your, I don't know what the right word is, but your dad probably knows better, but like that part of our mind that we're not, is not like the conscious um, executive function in the front mind, that part of the mind mm -hmm. that controls the heart and, and also kind of the, just- The autonomic nervous system. Yeah. And it also just mm -hmm. absorbs everything and believes everything. It doesn't know the difference of, is this real or not? Watching a TV show, our heart starts racing because, you know, a zombie pops out or something. That obviously it's an actor, but our subconscious mind, I guess, or whatever you want to call that, correct me with the right word if I'm not saying it right, but, um, you know, gets, gets triggered. And if we can be aware in real life or even on TV programming or anything, of when something is coming in and we're reacting from that part of us that doesn't like really understand what it actually is, then we need to go back and we need to commune with ourselves and fix that misunderstanding. Otherwise we're gonna be acting from that unconscious part of ourselves and we're not even gonna understand why we're doing what we're doing. Why do we reach for that chocolate all the time? Why do we get anxious? you know, when we see the color red, like what does that have to do with anything? You know, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think, first of all, if, if you have not watched The Social Dilemma on Netflix, it's mandatory viewing. Not like the, uh, not like the debates, Jake. That's <laughs> very much talking about what you're talking about now you know, the level of influence that social media has and how it goes about influencing. I think what's interesting though is when the influence is what would be referred to as subconscious, not necessarily unconscious. Okay. That's a really fascinating dynamic because what it's suggesting is that there's a stimulus that we're not conscious of. They used to do this in movie theaters. Uh, they actually banned it and outlawed it. You know, when I was a kid, they would put an image that was not detectable of popcorn. And so when I say not detectable, your brain didn't see popcorn on the screen and say, oh, there's popcorn on the screen. So they, they actually, if you will, flashed it at such a quick level that it wasn't able to register in our conscious mind, but it registered in our subconscious mind. And people would literally get up within seconds and go to the concession stand and buy popcorn. So, subliminal programming. Right? Subliminal, yeah. Was sub and that's exactly what the word means. It means subconscious. It means, you know, it, it's, it's registering in our brain, but we're not quite conscious of it. And the power of that is, is, um, is vast, actually. You know, it's, That's what chaos magic is all about. Like the practice of chaos magic is like, all the techniques are about pl planting stuff into your subconscious mind with the idea that we our expectations of reality are, are formed subconsciously and that those expectations end up basically creating the circumstances of our lives and like who we think we are and how things are going to go, you know, um, it's kind of like, it's, you know, it's like a postmodern version of magic that has a lot to do with psychology. Um, but yeah, it's, that's the main thing is how do you get something deep into your subconscious mind? How do you like trick your subconscious mind into believing something? And there's like various techniques on how to do that. But yeah, that's, that's, that's really the idea. 
you know, but sure, it can, it can be used for PR and stuff. It can be used to like sell you cigarettes or whatever. Or you can also use that understanding how it works for your own benefit, you know, and you can program yourself towards the outcomes you actually want to see and for you becoming the person you want to be in your life using subliminal messaging, essentially. But in a, you, you're brainwashing yourself intentionally for some kind of more favorable outcome. I think society is structured to be like that. And unfortunately, you know, um, I think it's psychological wa uh, warfare for the benefit of profit. And we've all been through it. You know, I've raised my two children watching all kinds of Disney movies and putting them in front of the TV when I couldn't take care of them while they're absorbing all this information. And only in my, you know, in my 40s now, I realize a lot of the things that I've exposed them to, but also that I've exposed myself, including all the subliminal thing that had caused kind of the demise of my mental health at one point. And I had to rely on medications to make me feel better and things like that. When essentially, like it says here on the book, the, the all is the mind. And I remember the first time where nothing was working for me, I went straight to meditation and Oh, the meditation, how it just changes so much. You become aware as the intrusion is coming towards you, you become aware of what those intrusions are. And then this is when you can start making changes. You become more aware of, of that. Um, and I was listening to a podcast, Jake, that you put on the chat with Jason Louv about. Oh yeah, That's such a good stuff. good stuff. Yeah, I didn't get to listen to the whole thing, but I got the beginning part of it where he was talking about how meditation increases the size of your hippocampus and decreases the size of the amygdala and how that affects your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So there, that's one example of how we can start working through like the mental transmutation by a process of, you know, meditation to give us the awareness not to be absorbing this subliminal things that are constantly attacking us on a daily basis. Mm. Damien Eccles posted some stuff in his Instagram story last night that was pretty interesting. He was talking about like energy vampires and he showed there's this, yeah. this doctor that did like um, some kind of like thermal imaging or something like that. I don't remember the technique that he did, but he basically was able to photograph the human aura and was able to basically like sh show what, what the human aura looks like. Um, and he, this guy wrote a book about psychic vampires where he gave, he did photos of what like the, the energy vampires aura looked like. And it was all like depleted and stuff like that. And then a healthy person's aura and then what it would look like, like then that person would hang out with this energy vampire and then that person's aura would be full. And then the other person's aura would be like completely drained, which is something we've all experienced kind of, you know, you just, you hang out with somebody who's like a bummer and you feel like shit afterwards. Like everybody knows that this is kind of like a way of showing it through actual sort of like scientifically demonstrable techniques that there's something deeper to it than just that, that it's actually like somebody zapping your energy away from you. And I think that that is um, definitely, definitely relates to what they're saying with how oneself can be changed or transmuted and that the states of others also may be through the same principles because mm -hmm. In the same way, if you hang out with somebody who's like really inspired and inspiring, you know, there's certain people that I've gone around, like anytime I've hung out with like Alex Gray, for example, and you just feel like inspired just by being around these people, like they are just emitting an energy where they strengthen your energy. They're like the sun, you know, and I think that um, the same is true if you get around really, really negative people, that there's certain people that just to come into contact with them, it's just like, oh, I, I can't, I feel bad now. You know, um, so we all, I think, know and understand and recognize this principle that we're all affecting each other and affecting each other's experience through life. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to see it actually demonstrated in that way. I think one, one way also to look at this, I remember in, in one of Malcolm Gladwell's books, he talked about the unconscious not being like Freud's unconscious, but he basically said our unconscious is just sort of a uh, landscape of associations. 
and, and the reality is that we are conditioned beings. You know, in fact, the ability for us to be conditioned is probably on the highest level, meaning, you know, it takes very little to condition us, you know, so sort of a lower level species may require numbers of sort of trials to condition them to do something where human beings can be conditioned very quickly, you know, and associations, our brain is organized in such a way where, you know, it's really always looking for the shortcut because it's processing so much information that it's constantly forming associations to things. And the problem is that this really starts at birth. So we have a lot of associations that affect the way we feel that we're not even cognizant of. It's even, it's, it's pre-verbal, you know, and, and you think about the amount of time we've spent before we really have such substantial cognition and all those associations that we formed and they, they drive us. They, they, it's, it's essentially, it's our subliminal life that we've created. Um, and I think recognizing and becoming aware of those associations and then being able to transmute, you know, detach from them, frees us from that. You know, yeah. This way you walk into, a, yeah, you can walk into a, a building and, and not feel good, you know, and you don't even know you've had a negative association with that building when you're four years old. You know, it, mm -hmm. not, it goes away. It's, it actually gets recorded, you know. Um, right, and it takes a particular shift in consciousness to be able to recognize and look at those associations, which, you know, meditation is one of the ways psychedelics also seem to help that process by altering your consciousness in such a way that you realize the programs that you're running. Um, did you guys know that psychedelics, one of the terms that was used for them before the term psychedelic became kind of standard was a uh, suggestogen. And uh, the I idea was that what they discovered was they were nonspecific amplifiers. So they couldn't really get at what they did because they did a lot of different things depending on the circumstances. And they found that they were suggestible, meaning that you could tell somebody that they were going to um, have a, you know, like a, a, a schizophrenic type experience and they would, or you could tell somebody before they took it. And this is like back before anybody knew anything about psychedelics. So they have like clean slates to work with people with, with minds that weren't already uh, colored by certain biases. And they could tell them, you're going to have a mystical experience. You're going to see the white light of God or whatever. And they would have that experience. So they basically found that people's experiences on psychedelics were colored by what they told them to expect. And so they, they found that they were very suggestible under their influence. And, you know, the CIA tried to use it for, for like, you know, brainwashing and stuff like that to, to not, it wasn't that, um, I mean, it arguably wasn't that effective, although there were probably some cases that were. Um, but yeah, it's just interesting. That's also what you're talking about because I think that when you're on, on psychedelics, you're kind of like, you know, it's like you're opening up that JavaScript box where you can like type in the code of your mind. You're like, you know, and that's even the metaphor that Dr. John Lilly used to describe psychedelics and the psychedelic experience was um, computer programming language that the mind is a computer that we can actually program and change and psychedelics are one of the tools that we can use to do that. But it's just, it's, it's interesting. I think that like there is a very strong relationship between psychology now and this stuff. I mean, like when this stuff was being written, they didn't really, I mean, this was written in the early 1900s, but like old, old hermetic stuff is like, you know, thousands of years old. They didn't have our modern, understanding and vocabulary of psychology that we use now. So they were basically talking about the same things, you know, mm -hmm. um, but like back then psychology and astrology and alchemy and all this stuff was all kind of like smushed together. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think uh, for that me, makes... a good example of mentalism and transmutation is if you're able to find a flow state with something, that kind of seems to be where that subconscious and your consciousness are kind of dancing together and 
you're like, I'm not even sure where this is coming from, but I'm just going with what's naturally coming. And, you know, when you first start, you need to really warm up and get into it. But once you hit that stride, you just kind of allow things to flow through you. And that transmutation might even be just the idea of manifesting itself physically into this world. Um, and so I think that and practicing meditation helps with that flow state. And that's kind of, I think, a meditation more in motion to me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, um, I'm a nurse and I, um, I definitely believe in the placebo effect, but it's, interesting because the placebo effect is essentially the body doing what it's supposed to be doing by your mind telling it to do what it's supposed to be doing or believing that it can do what it's supposed to be doing. And so, you know, there's not any scientific proof. Well, there is scientific proof that the placebo effect works, but there's no scientific understanding of how it works specifically. But I've come to believe that, you know, there's pills that do something we see how it affects you know the cellular you know structure of things and and this this medication is is suited specifically for this organism of this of your body and then you know you have you have that that works and we know that that, that works but when it comes to our minds and we're given something that does nothing but we're told that it does something our body automatically can often react and produce that same effect. There's, um, you, I don't know if you guys have seen it or anybody's seen it, but the documentary um, Heal, Heal, H-E-A-L. It's interesting. It's kind of, it's funny because it's like this like blonde Malibu chick that is, uh, is, is the narrator and the um, researcher um, to, to essentially go into um, different theories about how how people heal by alternative therapies, and um, I think a large part of that is just saying that if you can l lay the platform for you, for your body to heal, in, in other words, creating an environment in which your body can heal, and knowing that that's something that you can do and allowing for it to happen your body will automatically want to heal itself and i don't know where I'm, I'm getting with this exactly but but just the idea of um um using your mind to create change physically within yourself and and your energy by your mind state can create that change um, same as, you know, transmuting the idea of, 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 of auras or, or things like that, where, where you're absorbing their energy, maybe, or they're absorbing your energy. You're using your own innate energy to make a, make a difference within your own being. Anyway. <laughs> that makes sense. I, I wanted to mention, though, that um, although that whole placebo effect and us having the ability to kind of heal ourselves based on our mental state, it is um, just to add to that is really important. Also, what we're feeding our physical bodies. Um, Correct. You know, that's like the the number one. Um, yeah. Everything has to be in balance in order for this to be working. Uh, right. Properly. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where that's like creating that environment for the healing but then also using your mental to allow it. So your body can do what it needs to do with that right environment, with that, you know, right nutrition and, and balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the placebo effect is profound and amazing. And it is like, you know, essentially the same thing as magic, which is, you know, using your consciousness to affect your reality or the physical conditions of your reality. And uh, yeah, that there's this book called You Are the Placebo by Dr. Joe Dispenza. And he goes into you know, a lot of different cases and examples of how it's been used 
because his experience was that he was like um, run over by a car during a triathlon and he essentially used meditation techniques to heal his body. He was like told that he would never walk again. He's a lot like Dr. Strange, you know, like the real life Dr. Strange because he was a surgeon before that happened and he rejected traditional therapy, um, surgery to in favor of basically like more esoteric methods of healing and it worked and now he teaches workshops on it and has had a lot of success with teaching people the same techniques and helping them to heal all kinds of stuff um but yeah it's really fascinating it's definitely a, a very tangible example of, of this hermetic method of mental alchemy mental transmutation mm -hmm. I, I went to this um this healer um i don't remember his name but anyway he um he actually cured me of something which is pretty amazing but the way he did it because later on somebody asked him and i used to listen to his talks he said that all he does is he sees them from a higher level of awareness and then he sees them he sees what you re what we really are it's not just the body but like i don't know, other stuff whatever etheric body things i don't really understand that but something else and he he sees um, he sees how, he uses love, but he he sees it as like that's what we all are or something. And but I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't really understand his whole process. But he I I feel like he used this law of all his mind um, to be able to change the physical something within my mind within my you know etheric body within all the different levels of me so that it could redefine because it did it didn't happen overnight but it redefined my body had like a new set of instructions like maybe it was a correction and it just followed and 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 as it regenerated itself it regenerated itself in a healthy way which was pretty amazing for me mm -hmm. I mean, the, basis, how, uh, of this, oh, I think the basis of this book is mind. Everything is mind. You know, we hosted a conference years ago with Andrew Wheel, and uh, he was talking about these studies. And, you know, I remember what he said. He said, you know, we get these results back, and usually 1% to 3% have responded to placebos. And we throw that data out. And we concentrate on a 97% in regards to the response that the medication had. And he basically said it's, it's completely ass backwards. We need to throw out the 97%. Even if there's one person who responds to a placebo, it gives you an indication that the body has the ability to heal itself. And unlocking that is what we really need to understand. And is absolutely. We, we just quite sure how to do that, really. Well, the issue is, is that you wouldn't make any money doing that. No, of people. course, right. Yeah. So yeah. the medical well, you can do seminars. <laughs> <laughs> the medical industry is backwards, and all they're trying to do is make money off of people. It's a, it's a business. Mm -hmm. It's really sad. It is. It's the meat and potatoes of the pharmaceutical business to just sell for profit. Um, but the good thing about um, the evolution of medicine right now is, is I think is the multidisciplinary association of psychedelic studies in the U.S. and Canada. They're working towards um, using psychedelics for psychotherapy. And right now in Canada, like six uh, patients, um, who are experiencing like end of life treatment have been approved. And so far 80% have been saying that their life has completely changed in terms of they're more accepted, more, mm -hmm. you know, taking the whole thing with more acceptance. So um, the next study is going to be for eating disorders, um, which is here um, kind of like the highest rate of people who take their own lives or die because of an eating disorder, because there's no treatment that actually helps them overcome this, this thing that they're struggling with. So, you know, when, when I hear about the pharmaceutical business and how it's been manipulating, um, you know, the medical structure for so many years to see psychedelics kind of taking the, you know, the, 
the kind of platform at, at this moment, it makes me feel like maybe there's hope, <laughs> you know, um, for, I guess, for, for healing in, in general and to accept the fact that we don't need any chemical medications or anything like that, but we, through the use of a couple of times using psychedelics, we can come to that state of awareness and state of acceptance and love and connection with everything. Um, so I'm excited for that. I just wanted to throw that out since medicine came up in the, in the topic. Yeah, I was going to mention, oh, no, go ahead. Uh, do, do you mind? it's just, it's the way that you describe Salma with the healing is like what basically Coranderos and Peru who work with ayahuasca do traditionally, which is actually, you know, this kind of idea of, of you know, throngs of Western tourists going to drink ayahuasca in the Amazon. That's not actually how it's used in the traditional context. In the traditional context, a person who's ill would drink ayahuasca. And that's the only time they would actually use it. And they would only do it once. And they would do it with the, the curandero, who in that altered state of consciousness is able to read their energy and then diagnose what, what their illness is. After that, there may be other times where the curandero drinks ayahuasca, but the patient is not. And that in that altered state, the curandero is able to affect and work with their energy field to heal them you know, um, and they use a lot of, you know, they use plant medicines, they use um, different plants out of the Amazon rainforest as well to help with the healing process. It's not just the kind of, um, it's not just the shamanic work, but that is how they use ayahuasca. And it sounds very similar to what you were talking about, that in that state, they're able to actually see what is actually going on and read the energy system of that person and to be able to diagnose them and, and make changes on their behalf through song and through different shamanic tools and things like that. Um, what, what I was going to say is, I think there's another aspect to this that is really important, especially in this, um, this fear mongering e e era that we live in. Um, I noticed that, I noticed some people talking about people panicking. Um, when people panic, they can actually cause themselves a lot of harm. And that has to do with, you know, with their mind and what they're believing. So, for example, if people are drowning, um, if people most of the time will drown if they panic. And if they don't panic, they can float. If they only just calm down and, and play with the water and see how the water can hold them up and how they can bob up and down, you know, and, and catch a few breaths here and there without exhausting themselves. So speaking about the mind, we, I think it's really important in terms of like meditation um, or whatever tools that we can use to be able to calm our calm our use our, our minds our mental state to calm our nervous systems so that we don't freak out because i know i've heard stories of people who were having from nurses that i know like having panic attacks and then going to the hospital thinking they had covid because when you have a panic attack your lungs close up and you can't breathe and they're like no you're just having a panic attack you know because you think you have covid so I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's another aspect of not just like using the mind to change things, but like having control over our own minds, understanding how to use our mind to control our nervous system and to calm the crazy thoughts that we might have, like to, to be able to like step outside ourselves and see like, what is this instead of reacting. I think that's truly what meditation is. Yeah. You know, but I think people don't like to sort of phrase it this way, but meditation is mind control. It is yeah. learning how to control the mind through quieting, you know, and recognizing what, how it's being bombarded and not attaching to it and just really centering. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's funny, some of what you said earlier reminded me you know, Freud was really not that interested in what people actually had to say about their lives. His whole approach was to try to find a way to tap into the subconscious. 
you know, he used hypnotism. He actually, people don't know this about him. He was like the originator of tapping. He literally would go to his patients and tap on their, their forehead, you know. Um, and eventually he abandoned all that for free association, which is how Jung met him. Because Jung was also doing word associations. And when he recognized that Jung was, I mean, that Freud was trying to go underneath the level of cognition that would show what was really driving the engine, the subconscious, you know, and that that's where the modifications could be made. Uh, Jung was very excited by that. That's how they sort of joined together. Mm. So I think that when you get further on in this book, I happen to read the last chapter and the thing about, I think it's called mental, mental gender. And they're talking about the I and the me. And when we get there, somebody will explain what that's about. But <laughs> it is sort of what we're talking about. You know, that, that this underneath engine is what has to be allowed to surface in a way that it can be transmuted and changed. Something I found interesting was the, the hermetic principle and art underlying all these various forms of practice, good and evil for the forest can be used in opposite directions according to the hermetic principles of polarity. So it's like, yeah, PR is using this stuff to you know, influence people. The media is using it to uh, influence people, to engender fear and stuff like that. But it can also be used for, for good. It can also be used for positive transformation and stuff like that. And a lot of the stuff I think that you know, it's just normal for us, things like NLP and PR and all this stuff, like not that long ago would have been seen as sorcery of some kind, but now it's just kind of like, because we have understandings of psychology, we put it into a different category. It's just seen as normal. You know, Richard Bandler, speaking of NLP, um, he's one of the founder guys uh, of NLP. He said, he, he, he was very famous for saying, you know, I don't drink, I don't take drugs because I can create my own drugs. Like if you just have that one experience, you can recreate it in your own mind. So why not, speaking of um, placebo, like why not create the medicine within our own, you know, be able to create that medicine within our own minds too, like, right? I don't know, visualization or however many different ways, I suppose. I don't know if you guys have played with this, but if you like listen to a music piece during a strong psychedelic journey or, or a meaningful experience of some kind, and then you listen to that song again, sometimes you can almost like put yourself back into that experience, like have a like a flashback of it a little bit. Maybe you know, like I think there have been some like if they do double blind studies with with psychedelics, they use placebos actually. Um, as well for psychedelic research. I wonder if there have been any cases at all of people having psychedelic experiences when being given a placebo. You know, most of what I've heard from it is that if you're doing like injections of DMT and you give somebody a saline injection, it's pretty easy to tell like who got the DMT and who got the saline. But maybe there have been some cases where people actually do have altered state experiences through a placebo. I think it can be. Absolutely. I mean, I feel like I've gotten high because I don't really drink or take drugs or anything. I mean, I've tried psychedelics, but I feel like I can induce states. Sometimes it's from breathing, but sometimes it's just, I don't know, like something with my mind induce different states. Um, and then from those states, like from a trance state, there, there's it's very important meditation um, and, and be able, being able to go into this trance is very deep focus in order to do magic really, to, to do, you know, evocations, evocations, things. And if you've ever, I'm not, no expert in magic, but I mean, from what I've studied so far, the, the first thing they say is meditate and you may have to take like a whole year, you know, like meditate until you get to the point where you can really focus. Because if you can't, then you're just wasting your time doing anything else. Mm -hmm. 
I was thinking how I've seen in the internet that there's some people who can change the color of their eyes, their bone structure with the power of mind. Although I've not seen these examples in real life, but we hear it like in the internet and all. And I was wondering like, how does that even work? Does, like, does it go down to the DNA level and change things? And other people can tell that, yeah, this changed for you or, you know, stuff like that. Um, or is, is it even possible? Like, I think it's possible. I, when I was young, I had very curly hair. And now I have very curly hair again. But I always wanted straight hair. And one time I decided, just one day, I decided, like, I'm going to concentrate every day on straight hair. And I would visualize it. I would look in the mirror and pretend I had straight hair. I would just act as if I had straight hair. And then all of a sudden, my hair started growing out straight. Like, not super straight, but more straight like, like yours. Um, and, and then I decided I don't like my hair straight anymore, and I want really cool hair. And after, it took a while, it didn't happen overnight, but you know, maybe like a year later, I had like really curly hair again. So, I don't think that was magic. I mean, I think that's something anyone can do if it's important enough to them. Maybe they can't do it with their hair, but maybe it's something else. Maybe it's like growing a business, making money, or, you know, like getting somebody, you know, fixing a relationship. It could be anything that you really focus and put your mind and your full attention and intention on because there's so many different levels we're not even aware of that we influence. Yeah, I had an experience many years ago when biofeedback first came out. They were doing a uh, study at Berkeley, and I went to it, and they hooked me up to this machine, and I was told that I was to shut my eyes and simply concentrate on lowering my body temperature. I said, so what do you mean lowering my body temperature? You can't lower your body temperature. And they said, no, just try it, just try it. And, you know, I went into a pretty deep meditative place and probably about 30 minutes, 35 minutes later, a bell rang. I opened my eyes and there was my body temperature. It was down one degree. I thought it was the most remarkable thing I'd ever seen. And they came up to me and they said, okay, you know, take a moment. Now try it again. And this time it took me about 20 minutes. And he asked me to do it a third time. You know? So to me, that's remarkable, you know, that, that we have the power to do that. So we absolutely have the power to affect our bodies in ways that, and the universe, not just our bodies in ways that, you know, we just not come to really understand or embrace completely. I think that, you know, the placebo effect in regards to being able to influence health conditions and stuff like that is something that extends to all aspects of our lives and can be used to affect all aspects of our lives in the same way. And it's something that definitely should be studied. And to me, you know, like placebo effect is magic. And it's, uh, it's what, you know, people have been attempting to to do through magic for a long time and we have some scientific evidence that it's possible and it should be more thoroughly studied and understood and i guess there's like a lot of theories of mind in terms of how it works like one is is a quantum physics model where given that we all rose out of the big bang that we were all like one atom at some point that split into billions and trillions of tiny atoms that we're all like interlinked so if you have a like a thought about somebody because of the fact that the neurons in our brain and that person were at one point the same, you could actually have some kind of causal interaction between those two seemingly separate things. It's basically what they're saying here, you know, quantum physics. I'm not, I know nothing about quantum physics. I'll just say that right now. But um, it's basically from my, what I've heard is the same thing, which is when you understand that everything is interconnected in the universe that you can affect disparate things because they're all actually the same. They're all connected. So you change one thing and you change that thing. 
you know, and it creates a, a causal effect upon seemingly different disparate things. That's evident in the connection with people. Um, I remember having a partner a while back that, you know, we, we lived a little bit far from each other, but we were always connecting, like texting at the same time or uh, saying the same things all the time. You get it when you, you know, when you're connected to a person, all of a sudden you're finishing each other's sentences and you know each other so well, even though you're not spending a lot of time together or so things like that, it like it, what that's what it's reminding me of what you're saying in terms of connecting to others um, energetically. There's this thing in emotional freedom technique. I don't know if, if you know what emotional freedom technique. It's like talking and tapping, and it can change your health condition. It can change stuff happening in your body. You can lower your blood pressure, and it can also work with the um, I guess the the subconscious mind um, mm -hmm. to be able to change memories or to be able to relieve traumas and they use it for PTSD. Anyhow, so EFT can um, also affect other people. The really fascinating thing about EFT is if I'm talking and tapping on an issue that I had, and let's say you all join in and you're saying what I'm saying and you're talking and tapping, but you have a different issue, it can help your, because you really sort of like underneath it all, your unconscious mind, or maybe even your conscious mind knows what your issue is. And you don't even have to be talking and tapping. You could sort of be listening in the background, just sort of eavesdropping, and it can affect you. Which to me, I never really understood it how that can be, but people have sworn that this is this happens. And now that I read this chapter, I'm thinking maybe that's why, because there's that connection that's a, a mental level that is not, um, you know, that that's, I don't know what the right word is, I mean, it's just it's like higher level, you know, but if we're talking about those four levels that Jake was describing, maybe at, a, at one of those higher levels, the, um, the energy is getting unblocked um, and, the, and the chi is flowing um, because of that. And that at that higher level, it's able to affect not just one person, but many people, all the people on that same wavelength who are, are listening and hearing mm -hmm. about of what's going on. But I never really understood that before, but I think maybe this has something to do with it. There's also direct access. You know, we, we, have, um, we have what's called mirror neurons. In oh. our brain, you know, and they literally duplicate what is being observed. And it doesn't necessarily only have to be observed, you know, visually, you know, whatever the way, whatever sense observes what it is, it, it does get replicated in our own brain. Um, which is why people have different experiences, you know, with group meditation versus, you think about meditating with a group versus meditating alone. And in essence, it's really the same thing. I mean, if, if you're closing your eyes and being quiet, sort of what's the difference if you're alone or if you're with a group of people? That's a big difference. <laughs> you know, it, it's, energetically, it's, it's a huge difference. And so we're, we are picking up through various senses and these mirror neurons are replicating um, what's happening. Hmm. Yeah, it made me think is what, when you're going through some issue or a problem in your life and you're really keeping it in your mind, and then you're meeting a friend or let's say just like an acquaintance that has a different situation, but you just start talking about basically the same thing. And by bringing this issue or bringing this topic, you're kind of healing each other in a certain way, but the situations are still different, but there is a connection and it happens to me pretty much all the time when I'm going through 
something. So it's also very interesting mm -hmm. to observe how it happens. I think that's why group therapy can be powerful for people. Yeah. This common shared experience, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you guys heard of like peer support before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is one of the things that, you know, as Lika saying, that reminds me of sometimes people who struggle with uh, mental health, you know, issues, you know, you go see a therapist or a psychiatrist or a counselor. And sometimes because there's, it, they find it hard to meet that gap in terms of connection because they see, they walk into a room and they see a bunch of diplomas and somebody with a degree or a PhD and the intimidation begins. Whereas if you connect with peer workers, there are people who have lived experience and healed in their own mental health who are probably still managing in their recovery and such. Um, this is where the energetic exchange happens in kind of uh, in the way that they interact with each other and share with each other and um, promote healing within themselves. So it's a very therapeutic relationship with very high, for high in energy. Um, not to say that any therapist is bad or like I'm a peer worker and I see my psychotherapist once a week, <laughs> you know, so it's just, but it's just that making the cycle flow nicely. Um, it's good to connect with others in, in different ways, yeah. I've, I've had that experience with going to like men's circles or whatever. There's something that's, uh, and I've heard people have this experience with like, you know, AA meetings and stuff like that. But um, there's something that actually is very relieving to hear that other people struggle with like similar circumstances that when you're isolated in your own experience and you're not sharing that experience with others, it feels like, wow, this thing is happening to me. But when you get to a place of beginning to speak about a particular issue with a group of people and they've all, they're all struggling with something similar, you kind of realize like, oh, this is a, a human experience. Like this isn't about me and I'm not a victim, like independently, this is just something that happens as a person. And, and there's something that can be like, even in situations when I've gone to those types of groups and I've just listened, like I haven't even shared much about what's going on with myself, there's still some relief that comes out of it to understand and to realize that people are, are dealing with similar things. Mm -hmm. yeah. I noticed when I talk to my son about that, because he'll sometimes, he goes, you know, everyone does, they go through hardships or things with friends or work or whatever in life and when I tell him you know part of the things that I, I tell him is that yeah this is this is what happens a lot of people go through it and not that he should dismiss it but you know it's not like he's some freak or that we're, because it's really hard to feel like a victim and you're the only one that nobody can ever understand and if you know that this happens all the time and people overcome it. It's, I feel like it's, your mind is in a different place and you can use your mind now to solve that problem instead of feeling so overwhelmed, like, oh my God, what is, this is horrible. Like, like when, um, when, when Jake did his, his talk, that amazing talk about his childhood, and I sent it to like so many people because I felt like it oh, was for me. You. It was, you're welcome. It was very healing for me and the courage that you had to be able to discuss it. And I realized, wow, you know, like so many people go through this and people overcome. And you're an example of somebody who's overcome, not only just overcome, but has excelled and has blossomed and has used it as fuel or transmuted it, you know, and, and I'm like, what an inspiration. So that power of the, of, of the mind when we know that we're going through a common experience and then we see how other people have overcome it or at least we know that they have it's so powerful it, it just make it shifts our mind it can shift our mind um and I, and I also wanted to say something about believing that something's already happened did you use that jake like when you were in that terms of manifestation when you were um like a few years back whatever just starting out did you imagine that something that you wanted has already happened? You, I thought you were talking about like winning yeah. certain things and stuff. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's something I remember even doing when I was like a little kid with the, the contest example. Um, but even when I made those shifts in my body, I, I basically, yeah, I, I, I reframed my self-image and uh, calibrated my self-image into being this more, you know, healthy, happy person. And that's when the shifts began to occur in my body. So it was kind of like first reframing my beliefs about myself and my circumstance changing my perspective on it that seemed to help. And that's also like, for me, when it comes to like manifestation or whatever you want to call it, um, that still seems to be the technique that works the best. It's kind of like a, a placebo type effect of celebrating something um, and putting myself in an energy of hopeful expectancy that that thing has already occurred. And is you know, like I'm celebrating that and that seems to really work. And uh, Bryce and Tasha, thanks for thanks for coming, guys. I'll see you next week. Good night. I'm going to leave also. I'm going to have the experience of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. See you guys next week. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Love you, Jake. Love you too, Dad. See you soon. See you next week. Yeah, I think I should probably go too. It's... Okay. We could, I mean, we can also like... This, because we only read, you know, one short chapter, we could also make this meeting a little bit shorter, maybe, maybe call it a close if anybody wants to. I feel like we covered a lot of really good territory. If anybody wants to chime in on some kind of like closing thoughts, but maybe we start to wind it down. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say, for example, I know Salma brought your experience about going through your own mental transmutation. Um, and then like, we see people like Damien Eccles or anybody who's got a story to share that things that they overcome, Rocky. Like, um, you know what I mean? So it's like, it is possible to get there. Um, it's just a matter of putting the work in all the time. And I remember, um, I think, can remember his name. He just left with his girlfriend, but he was saying about like meditation and motion. It, it's just always being in that state of mind. And even Joe Dispenza said the other day on his Instagram, he put a video where he uh, gets caught up in the, in the busyness of the material and then he forgets about putting in the work and then he has to remind himself. So it's just like always reminding ourselves, well, we have the ability to be magical. And mm -hmm. like we see people like you, you spreading the word and, you know, connecting us to other people who have been through their own experience and now their recovery is showing something completely different from you. So it's just beautiful, I think, to see in general, everybody who's willing to put themselves out there, share their story and just show their topic so you can believe in your own as well and make it happen. I just want to say that too, before leaving. Yeah, I, oh, I appreciate yeah. that a lot. And I also think that as much as we get to be cognizant of, you know, how, how we are always powerful, like just knowing that and knowing that even when we're not aware of it, we're still doing it. So in other words, we, we sometimes do things to other people or affect other people with our energies just because we're maybe in a state of disease and that's going to still translate to other people as well. So Mm -hmm. cognizant of it on both ends I guess yeah and it's a it's a process too you know um, yeah like I have definitely my my mental ups and downs I'm sure everybody does um it'd be interesting like I've never heard Damien Eccles talk about this but like his process of when he was first incarcerated like did he have a lot of despair like I know he talks about kind of like just being on the other side of it and being grateful for that experience but you have to wonder was that really hard? You know, I bet he, he did struggle a lot with that condition before he kind of got to a place of acceptance around it. Oh, yeah. Have you seen the uh, West Memphis Three documentaries? Because they're free on no, it's Right. It's called, uh, uh, what's it called? Paradise Lost, right? Yeah, they're, that kind of paints the huge picture of what it was like. And I just, the one reason why I consider him like one of my mentors, it's this man was in solitary confinement for 10 years and never gave yeah. up trying to contact the outside of that world because he knew he was going to get out. I mean, that's 
magic at another level. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's, well, yeah. And, and he did a, a lot of ritual also. Like, I mean, he was using uh, real magic too, but it worked and magic does work, you know, and he proves that. Yeah. Yeah. What is the name of the documentary you mentioned? I think it's called Paradise Lost. Oh, okay. Is it a series or is it just one? I'm looking, trying to look it up right now. There's two of them. It's like an HBO series, right? Yeah, there's two of them and they're free on YouTube. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Damien Eccles also like just amazing spiritual teacher has a, a lot of free videos up on YouTube about you know different subjects related to magic and ceremonial magic specifically, but also like meditation, you know, just general <laughs> mental health stuff. Really recommend checking it out. Mm -hmm. He's got this water ritual. I'm not sure if you've seen it, where he charges the water energy and then he drinks it. So that's kind of like mm, one of yeah. the things that I've learned from him that is just makes a whole big difference. Whether it's doing anything or not, in my mind, it's doing something, right? So. It's great. Yeah, I've done it. Mm -hmm. Cool, guys. Well, thanks again for coming on this call. It's always really fun to nerd out with you guys, and I'm excited for next week. We'll continue to read on. I guess we're at chapter four, The All, which will begin our discussion next week and uh, go from there. This has been an exciting process. I feel like we're covering a lot of good material and finding also ways to integrate this stuff so that it's practical which is really valuable. And I hope that people that are listening to it, because I don't know if you guys know this, but these are getting a lot of downloads. Like some of the other weeks got like 70, 80, 90 downloads. So like a lot of people are listening to these discussions, even though they're not participating in the live conversation. So thanks to everybody out there in the future that's listening. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, uh, Thanks. Thank you and much love. Thank you. Thank you. Good night or have a good day, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye.